three times as much about computers than me. You're born this way. Okay, so that one's, yeah, that, maybe it's these two are, but basically what it comes down to is um, you've got, uh, since the war on cancer started, Nixon started the war on cancer. Anytime the U.S. government starts a war on anything, it's a dismal failure. It's lousy. <laughs> I think we got really, we got big heads after World War II, and ever since then, then every war we got about war on drugs, war on poverty, you know, war on cancer. There it is. Okay. This guy is an oncologist. Another book talking about how dismal the war on cancer is. Uh, An Anatomy of Failure is the name of the book. And the reason why is this, is that they're, what they're doing is, they're saying, if you can fast track this thing, if you can shrink a, a laboratory rat tumor by 10%, then you get a fast track under the FDA, is what it comes down to. And then the drug becomes popular, popularized in the Wall Street Journal and the stock skyrockets. And we all know how well pharmaceutical companies do because they're the ones that, they're the only ones that left have the money to advertise on TV anymore. Every, every commercial, if not every other commercial in the evening news, is a drug commercial. And how many people knew that Viagra was originally a hypertensive drug? Did you know that? Viagra was created originally as a drug for high blood pressure. And they found out that it increased nitrous oxide release from the lining of the blood vessels, which is, relaxes the blood vessels, which lowers the hypertension, but it also does something else to guys. And lo and behold, it was a huge money maker. And now Bob Dole is the poster child for Viagra. But the point is, is that the, the war on cancer, uh, if you look at the following statistics here, I might be battery dead here, so I'm gonna ask you to do it manually when I do this, how's that? Okay. This is the guy who actually came forward and tried to stop bovine growth hormone being injected into American dairy cows. And of course was marginalized and ignored. He has this thing called the uh, Stop Cancer Before It Starts campaign. How to win the losing war against cancer? PreventCancer.com. So, here's the statistics that show that all that money you donate to the American Cancer Society is really paying off. From 1973 to 1999, breast cancer, depending if it's under or over 50 years of age, about 54 percent. Kidney cancer up 40 percent. Liver cancer up 103 percent. Lung cancer up 143 percent. Malignant melanoma 156 percent. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is up about 87 percent. Prostate cancer is up 105 percent. And testic testicular cancer is up 67 percent. Well, with victory numbers like that, you know, you know, who needs to lose? And this is, this is what we spent $200 million in research on since the war on cancer was declared. $200 million. And we got a flat line. Childhood cancers. This is what I said earlier. They say, well, it's because we're all getting older. There's more older people, and older people get cancer more often because their immune systems are weaker. And then if you look at children, in the same, same time frame, bone and joint, brain leukemia, and uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia are up, you know, statistically in a very, very large way. So it has nothing to do with age relative to them losing the war on cancer. Between 73 and 99, cancer deaths increased 30%. For the first time in 2005, according to the Los Angeles Times, cancer has surpassed, surpassed heart disease as the top killer of Americans under the age of 85. We always thought cancer was number two, not under the age of 85. We have 1.3 million diagnosed and 570, half that many die. So twice as many are diagnosed every year, 1.3 million, and about 600,000, it's up to 600,000 die every year. In the 25 to 35 year old age group, the National Cancer Institute showed that survival rates have not increased at all since 75. And this is a good one out of the Wall Street Journal. But cancer is a leading disease killer in people aged 20 to 39. More than 70,000 young adults get cancer every year. So they can show you all the statistics 
they want, but they lie. So people say, well, you know, you talk about all this stuff, if there's just one thing or two things you can not do, what are they? Well, cancer's a complicated illness. If you want to prevent cancer, two big things not to do is get off the refined carbohydrates and get off the damaged omega-6 oils. Those are the two big ones. Refined carbohydrates, cancer has 6 to 15 times more insulin receptor sites on its cell surface than healthy cells do. That's why a vast majority of cancer patients die from a wasting disease called cachexia, because it steals your energy. It loves glucose. If you look at the per capita consumption, when you look at 1946, the per capita consumption of soft drinks in the United States was 10 and a half gallons of pop, and today it's 57 gallons per person per year. And of course, they're not even sweetening it with cane sugar. They've gone one step more evil, and that's high fructose corn syrup. Insulin directs inflammatory eicosanoid pathways. What's that? Well, cancer is an inflammatory problem, as is heart disease, as is arthritis. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Otto Warburg got the Nobel Prize in 1931 or 32 for the research that he did in 1925. He got the Nobel Prize for this that uh, the metabolism of cancer cells is predicated on a decrease in oxygen to the cell up when it gets to be about 30 to 35 percent. Instead of going through oxidation, it goes through lactofermentation. And that drops the pH of the cell. You ever hear about the fact that can't, people with cancer have a pH issue? I talked to a woman in California had pancreatic cancer. Her pHs were in the high threes. Remember, pH is logarithmic. I find it interesting about pH. Ideal soil pH is when you get the minerals balanced, 6-4. Plant sap pH when it's really healthy, 6-4. Saliva pH first thing in the morning, 6-4, or thereabouts. Are we being taught something here? Is there another elephant standing in the room? The pH is an exchange of energy, oxygen, reduction. That's what it is. It's all about oxygen reduction. Hydrogen ions, oxygen ions. It's the exchange of energy. Yes? What are some of the largest sources of degraded omega-6 oil? The question is, what are some of the largest sources of the degraded omega-6 oils in the fast foods and deep fryer fats? The problem we have, let's see if we get there here. The problem we have with the cell membrane, being that it's fat, it consists of omega-3 and omega-6 fats. Omega-3 and omega-6 fats are very, very uh, attracted to oxygen, or oxygen is attracted to the fat. And that's a good thing because that pulls oxygen inside the cell where you burn it with glucose inside the furnace called the mitochondria. That cell membrane has got openings, portals called transport proteins that open and close based on that 70 millivolts of electricity that, that's also predicated on the pH differences from inside and outside. 70 millivolts of electricity open and close and it allows the oxygen to get in and allows waste to get out. Now that being said, if you damage the omegas, that's why you can't cook with omega-3s. And that's why plants make omega-6s. Omega-6s you can cook with because they don't oxidize as readily as an omega-3. And yet the same plant will make both. It'll make omega-3 when it starts out. You take wheat, you put wheat in the soil, it grows wheatgrass. That wheatgrass is loaded with omega-3 or alpha linoleic acid, parent omega-3. Then it turns into a wheat stalk with a grain on the top and all that omega-3 now is converted by a desaturase enzyme into omega-6. Why? Why does it do that? Because omega-6 is a storage fat. It's a future omega-3 fat. And the reason why plants need omega-3 is because the chloroplast, which is where chlorophyll is made, where, where photosynthesis occurs, in this organ of the plant called the chloroplast, has a fatty membrane made out of omega-3. No omega-3s, no chloroplast, no chloroplast, no photosynthesis. The plant, in its wisdom, uses omega-3s, keeps them, and then, as the plant no longer is a green plant, 